That was good, wasn't it? I enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Pastor Bill, for inviting me to speak again at this church. Um, I've really enjoyed coming here the last few weeks, last few, a few Sundays, so it's a great church, and yeah, I thank God that I'm part of it. Um, yeah, today I want to speak on the cross of Christ. It's something that is really central to our belief system. It's central to us, um, and I think it wouldn't hurt to preach a little bit more on it sometimes. You agree? So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to preach on the cross. Um, first of all, I want to open, if you've got your Bibles here, um, who has their Bible? Who still brings their Bibles to church? Anyone? Those oldies and me too. Yeah, uh, yes. Back, yep. Yeah. Oops, here's my notes. It's good to bring your Bible. I like to have a Bible to ch- uh, in church so I can sort of, you know, flick through it, get to know your Bible and stuff. I think it's important. So you look at the screen and you look at the Bible too. Yeah. Okay. Jeremiah 31, 31. Let's begin. I want to give you an introduction to the whole big picture right now. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And here's the best part right here. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is a prophecy hundreds of years before Christ came. And it's speaking primarily to the people of Israel, yet also to the future generations of the people of the whole world. You know, many times when the um, major prophets spoke, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, um, they were not only speaking to the nation of Israel, but they were also seeing further um, to the whole world that we would be grafted into the nation of Israel at one point in time to receive salvation that was promised to Abraham in the book of Genesis. So, <clears throat> who is this person? Who is this man? Who is this figure that is chosen to make this happen? And I want to talk right now about how that happened. How did God remember our sins no more and forgive our wickedness? Well, all throughout the Old Testament, it talks about a Messiah. The Messiah would be God in the flesh, born of a virgin uh, who was to come into the world. And he was going to be the saviour of the whole world. Isaiah prophesies a lot about him um, Zechariah, the prophets all talk about him. Psalms talk about him. So who is this Messiah? I want us to turn right now to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1. It says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days... He has spoken to us by his son. So it's interesting, isn't it, how back then it was the last days. They saw themselves as in the last days. Well, if we're living 2,000 years later, what are we living in now? (laughs) Okay. He's spoken to us by his son. Now, can you ever imagine, have you ever thought, I really wish that Jesus could be here today or God could just appear to us and talk to me straight. You know what I mean? No more Bible, no more Holy Spirit, we want, we want Jesus to come in the flesh and just talk to us as a human being. Don't you wish that was possible? Who's ever thought, oh, if only God were here right now? Or if only Jesus were here in the flesh right now? Yeah, you've thought of that, haven't you? I have too. It's not very intelligent thinking, but we've all done it. Um, so here it says, 
But in these last days, he had spoken to us by his son. So the author of Hebrews obviously had heard Jesus speaking face to face. This actually did happen already. 2,000 years ago, God did come in the flesh and he did speak to his people. Why? To show Israel and the world not only the Messiah, but God the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As, isn't that amazing? So we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. That's the Trinity. But they're three in one. They're one, but they're also three unique persons. And it continues on here to say, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So God the Son, Jesus, he created the universe, but he also sustains the universe by his powerful word. The Apostle Paul said that in him we move, we breathe, we have our being. So it's like he... He is the creator, but he also sustains life on earth. He is the one that makes your heart continue to beat. He makes the cells in your body operate. He makes everything in, in your human body, your physical body, operate. If he were to withdraw his word, you would withdraw from life. Remember in the book of Genesis how God made Adam. What did he do? He made him from the dust of the earth and he breathed life into into him, and it says, and, and the man became a living being. Now, the Hebrew word for breath also means wind or spirit. So basically, he breathed the breath of life into Adam, and then man became a living being. So we're body, soul, and spirit. The spirit that is in us is, is the God part of us that connects with the Lord. If he were to take away his word, we would be, that would be the end, kaput. So obviously he's still there, isn't he? Up there at the right hand of the Father. Okay. So I want to continue right now about Jesus for a little bit. How many of you know that when Jesus came, he came with a mission? He didn't just come any, anyhow or willy-nilly. He came with a mission. He came from heaven to earth for a purpose. What was that purpose? To redeem the nation of Israel and the whole world. To bring all men under one banner. To save people from their sins. Now we don't always understand the, the dynamics of spiritual laws sometimes, but I'm telling you, if Jesus, if the Messiah would not, did not come, we would all be lost. But thank God that he did come. And he came not only because he was forced, but because he wanted to. How many of you have ever gone to work because you're forced to go to work? It's like, oh, here we go again. Another day, another dollar or another $500, whatever you make. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe back in the 20s or something, it was a dollar, but not anymore. Um, so... No, 20s, there was no dollar. What was it? It's another currency. That's right. Oops. <laughs> Goes to show you when I was born. Um, yeah. So anyway. So Christ came with a mission and a purpose, and that purpose was to be the saviour of the world. Why is it that Jesus is the only one that we know as a saviour. There are so many prophets, so many religions. Why is it that Jesus is the only saviour? Well, according to the Jewish religion, Judaism, the Messiah had to obey the law 100%. When Christ came, he's the only one who has ever obeyed the law 100%. Every single detail of the law. Sometimes he offended the Pharisees. Um, they thought he was breaking the Sabbath and things like that, but they were actually going by additional laws that were made in the intertestimonial period. I hope I said that right. Uh, t no, intertestamental period. That's right, yes. <laughs> Is that correct? <laughs> okay. Anyway, in the 400 years that, uh, between Malachi and Matthew. Now we're all together, aren't we? Yeah. 
great. And so, so during that time, a lot of additional regulations and things were put on the people, and it was more like a yoke of slavery to them rather than setting them free. That's why Jesus really had to go a lot of the time at the, at the religious people, um, teachers of the law, um, because they were making them do things that was not really biblical. But when Christ came, he not only obeyed the law, but he brought the heart of the law to the people. If you read the Old Testament, it's not all doom and gloom. There's actually a lot of, a lot of redemption in it. There's actually a lot of compassion, a lot of love in the Old Testament. And so when Christ came, he revealed to people, who is this God who is the, the author of the book of Psalms, the author of Genesis, Exodus, the Pentateuch, Judges, you know, of course, they're all authors, human authors, but who is the author who inspired these people? You know, whenever I read the Psalms, for example, I love to, I love to read them and not, not just read it as a book, but think that same spirit that inspired the author, I want that to, him to move in my life. You know, I want to receive some of that spiritual power that those authors received. I, I want an uh, impartation, you know, from the Holy Spirit to me. So Jesus was qualified. Not only that, but he came from a royal line physically. Um, as we find in the beginning of Matthew, you've got the line, the, the generations, the, uh, what do you call them? Thank you very much, genealogy. The genealogies. And he was a priest. But he was not the priest of the Aaronic priesthood. He was a priest of Melchizedek, which is by faith, not by the law only. And so that comes from a heavenly order, not from an earthly order. So Christ was qualified. It says in John chapter 1, verse 1, and I love, this is one of my favorite passages of scripture of all time. In the beginning, think about that in the beginning, the beginning. When there's blackness, there's darkness, there's absolutely nothing. No time, no space, nothing is existing. Can you imagine a time when, that was, when, when it was like that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God, he was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. And without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was light, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Okay. Um, so the darkness did not understand Christ when He came. Yet in verse 12, it says, but to all who believed him, to all, sorry, to who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of the will of the Father or the flesh, but born of God. How is that made possible? Well, Christ came as a baby. He grew up just like you and me. He felt pain. He, I don't believe he was ever sick. That's my personal who knows? But, um, <laughs> but obviously, he was a human like us. He went through things like us. He had family problems. He had relationship issues. He had, but, but he never sinned in all of the things he went through. He knew what it was like to have uh, the Romans over them and, in a way, oppressing them from time to time. He knew what it was like, and yet he did not hold bitterness towards them. Amazing. He carried the peace of God. He carried the power of God. He carried the boldness of God. Why? Because he was God in the flesh. And, and when he came, he spoke as no other man did. Remember the time when they sent temple guards to arrest him when he was teaching, when he was saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever believes in me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And uh, the temple guards were listening and they just thought, we can't arrest him. They went back and said, look, no one's spoken like this man speaks. I'm sorry, but we're not going to arrest him. 
I mean, there was something about him. He spoke with authority. Demons were cast out where the religious leaders didn't cast out demons. Some of them tried, but they weren't very good at it if they did. Um, Even uh, in the book of Acts, it talks about the seven sons of Sceva who ended up getting absolutely thrashed by some really crazy ones, demons. And... um, So, you know, when they tried, they weren't often sure what they were doing. But when Christ came, he would just say, go. And they all left. I mean, he spoke from heaven's perspective. He spoke about the kingdom of heaven. He spoke, he said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he spoke about end times. He spoke about how he's going away and he's coming back again. He spoke about how to be saved, how to be in God's kingdom, how to humble yourself as a child. And he he was not scared. He was not afraid of anything. I love reading about Jesus. You know, I could read the Gospels forever and ever because Jesus was unlike any other man in the history of the world. And so the time finally came for some of the other predictions in Isaiah 53 and 50 and Psalm 22 to come to pass. And what was that? That Christ, as he himself said many times, that Christ has to suffer, but after three days will rise again. He'll be handed over to the Gentiles, but he will rise again. As it says in Isaiah 53, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. But before that was going to happen, he had to endure the cross. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Well, there is, there is a law, and that is that the wages of sin is death. The, there's a law of sin and death. Basically, when you do the wrong thing, there is a punishment. How do we avoid that? Well, Christ came to show us and to do it for us in a way. The time came when he'd just given the Last Supper and he had the bread and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take it and eat. It's broken for you. And he said, this is my blood, referring to the wine. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for for you. Take it and drink. At that point in time, the disciples were not entirely sure what was going on, but they knew something special was happening here. So they took it, the very first communion, which was connected with the Passover. It was that time of year too, the Passover. And then as they went down to the Mount of Olives to pray, Jesus began to pray in a way that he didn't normally pray. I don't know, he might have, but this was different. And he was praying so earnestly that the Bible says drops of blood started to come. He sweat. He started to sweat drops of blood. Maybe the capillaries were burst, bursting in, in his forehead. You know, that's, um, there's a scientific term for that, which I won't pretend I know. But, um, <laughs> but basically, something unusual was happening. And he knew that he was going to the cross. And he prayed to the Father. He said, if it's possible, take this cup from me. If there's any possible way that I don't, so I don't have to go through this, Lord, Father, take this cup from me. And he went back three times and prayed the same thing. And his disciples were sleeping. They weren't even really aware of what was going on. But in the end, he said, but not my will, but yours be done. After he decided, yes, I'm definitely going to the cross. Because, you know, sometimes even for great men of God, there's testing. Well, for Jesus, it was a test, a great big test. After that happened, they came, Judas Iscariot, his treasurer, his friend who has been with him for three and a half years, led a company of soldiers to to arrest him. And he said, the one I kiss is, is the one. 
So Judas came and kissed him on the cheek and said, Hail, Rabbi. And Jesus looked at him and said, You betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And I love it in John how it says, Who are you looking for? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. When he said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. (laughs) I mean, that's the power of God right there. Knock them to the ground. All these guards, they're on the ground. (laughs) Then they get up and he says, who are you looking for? As if nothing happened. (laughs) I am he. I told you, I told you I'm he. Then let these men go. I don't have time to illustrate the whole thing. I've got eight minutes. And I'm just beginning. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so Peter draws his sword, cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus, having compassion on Malchus, says, Peter, put away your sword, for those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He picks up the ear, or I don't know exactly how he did it, but the Bible says he touched the man's ear and he was healed. Can you imagine that? With all the situations that's going on, Jesus, even with the people who've come to arrest him, he cares for Malchus, who's just a servant, and puts his ear back on in its place. Still, their hearts are hard and they, they pretend it didn't happen and they arrested him. They began beating him. They took him to the Sanhedrin, which is where the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they came together to, uh, in the middle of the night, which was not normally done, but they wanted to do things their way. You know, corruption is, is everywhere sometimes and it was definitely there that night. And witnesses came around and began to judge and say, You know, he did this, he did that, but their testimony did not agree. Until finally two people came forward and, and 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 agreed on at least something, which was that he said he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Finally, the high priest asks him the question, so tell me plainly, are you the Messiah, the son of the living God? And finally Jesus talks. And he looks at them and says, I am. And from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Father and coming on the clouds of heaven. So what's he doing there? He's connecting Psalm 110 and Daniel, I think it's chapter 7, and the prophecies of Christ and bringing them together. Everyone knew what he was saying. He was saying, I am the one Daniel prophesied about. I'm the one... The Psalms spoke about, I am the Messiah who has come. And now this is part of what has to happen. These people were teachers of the law, but they could not understand it because they had rejected Christ out of their own pride and ignorance and their own choice. So then the time came when they stand. Let me just cut a long story short here. He's he's standing He's standing before Pontius Pilate. Pilate talks to him and says, so you are a king then? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have fought to prevent my arrest. But now my kingdom is from another place. Now Pilate did not want to uh, kill Jesus because his wife had had a dream warning him not to do it, saying he's a holy man. However, the people began to put pressure on him. They cried out and said, Crucify him. And Pilate washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And do you know what the people said? They said, let his blood be on us and on our children. They had no idea what they were saying. (laughs) And then from there, Pilate said, no, I'll chasten him severely. I will punish him, but then let him go. They sent him to be flogged with a cat of nine tails. Those floggings were so extreme that at times internal organs were exposed. By the, that's the way the Romans did it. And the, um, there was no rules like, like with the Jews. This is what um, Pastor, Pastor was talking about the other week. Um, Pastor David Smythe. 
Hey, he said with the Jews, you could do them 40, 40 lashes minus one. With the Romans, they didn't have those rules. So we don't know how many times Jesus was flogged. But it was obviously severely by their standards. Until finally they brought him out, presented him to the people, uh, uh, covered in blood, lacerations on his body, crown of thorns on his head where they'd been beating him and mocking him. And they said, he said, what shall I do with him? They said, crucify, crucify. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. So finally, they sent him away to be crucified. He carried the cross with the help of Simon of Cyrene all the way to the cross. And there they stretched him out. They stretched out his arms. They on the cross, they stretched out his feet and began nailing his, his hands and his feet. Now, most um, scholars believe that they, they crucified him with the um, nail going through the wrists so that he would not fall off the cross. Now, according to the book Case for Christ, um, who's read that book? It's a really good book. According to that book, it says that there's a, a nerve going through your funny bone and through here. So when, when this is crushed, it actually causes a lot of pain. And that's where we got the word excruciating from. X means out of and then crook, crux, cross. Out of the cross to describe the kind of pain that a person crucified would go through. And so, he's, and, uh, so Jesus is there on the cross. He's already suffered But now he's doing something for you and for me that no one else could have done. He's hanging there for for a number of hours. And on the right and on the left are two criminals. One of the criminals is is saying, you call yourself the the, the Messiah. If you're really the Savior, you know, save us, help us. So he was abusing him. The other criminal said, don't you fear God since we're under the same sentence? And he turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him, even in his agony. He said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And from there, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And he looked up to heaven and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the Bible says he gave up his spirit and then breathed his last breath. At that moment, the Bible says the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, something that was physically impossible to do. Only God could do such a thing like that. The Bible says there was an earthquake um, and the darkness, maybe a solar eclipse, Darkness came over the land. Supernatural things were happening. Why? Because something in the spirit was happening in conjunction with physical things that were happening. You see, the power of sin and death was being broken. The stranglehold that the enemy, the devil had had over mankind was finally being broken. Jesus, when he was on the cross and he cried his last breath, something happened. The power of the devil was broken forever and ever and ever. And let me tell you something. Amen. Let me tell you something. And today, he has no more power over people, especially over the saints of God, who take up his authority and exercise the authority. Why? Because it's given to us, the church. The redeeming, saving, miraculous, healing power of God was conferred on us. And he said, and I confer on you a kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That's why my time is up by one minute. Um, But I am going to pray. We're going to go into time of, of ministry time right now because I believe that the power of God is here to set people free, you know. Amen. It's... So what I want us to do is to look to the cross. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, it says, And by his wounds we're healed. By his stripes, we're healed. He took up our infirmities. He carried our diseases. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you've been struggling with an illness, a sickness. And you know what I want you to do? I want you to have faith. 
And I'm, I'm not one of those faith preachers that condemn people for not having faith, okay? That, there's not many of them anymore. They were more the 50s and 40s. But anyway, um, <laughs> but let me, t- let me tell you something. Jesus was someone who loved faith. If you've ever read your Bible, Jesus loved faith. It impressed him. There was something about it that he was happy with. Are you, are you believing God to do something in your life? Maybe it's even for someone who needs to get to know Jesus. Or maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus. I want to tell you, now is your time. I've explained the gospel to you. I've explained the ABCs of what Jesus did. Now it's time to respond. You see, the cross demands a, 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 a response. There's no one that can just back away from the cross and say, it doesn't apply to me. No, the cross applies to everybody Every man, woman, and child from every nation on earth in every language. The cross applies to you. The cross applies to them. And it demands a response. So today, if you have never given your life to Jesus, if you've never received him into your heart and said, Lord, forgive me of my sin, now's your opportunity to either accept him or reject him. So don't just sit on the fence. You either accept him or you reject him. I remember the time in my own life when I made the decision, Lord, if this is all true and I find out it's true, then I will commit the rest of my life to following you. But if I find out it's not true, I'll never step foot in a church again. And I can't explain to you how he did it, but he revealed himself to me in such a strong, real way that I was convinced, convinced that the gospel is the real thing and that Jesus is real and the Holy Spirit does exist and he's here with us. I could keep on preaching, but I need to stop. (laughs) Amen. Let's stand up on our feet right now.